On the 16th of May 1940, a French B-1 Bis tank rumbled alone down this village street in an attempt to halt the seemingly unstoppable German Blitzkrieg. At stake was the fate of France. Over the next few minutes, a storm of fire erupted, at the end of which the French tank still stood. Around it were the burning remains of no less than 13 German panzers. In the space of just a few moments, the myth of German armour invincibility had been shattered, but the fate of France had also been sealed. This is the story of the incredible action that is today known as the Ston Tank Battle. When France and Britain had declared war on Germany in September 1939, a few skirmishes had broken out across the Franco-German border. But since then, a period of quiet had taken hold in what the West know as the Phony War and the Germans as Sitzkrieg. All that changed on the morning of the 10th of May when two German army groups launched their famed Blitzkrieg attacks into northern France and Belgium. Attempting to outflank the formidable Maginot Line, Army Group B had advanced into Belgium, there to be met and temporarily held by the British and French First Army on a line along the River Dial. But, unknown to the defenders, this was not the main thrust. That was to be made by tanks of General Heinz Guderian's 19th Panzer Corps through the lightly held Ardennes region. Erroneously discounted by French strategists in the 1930s, it was believed that tanks couldn't penetrate the thick forests of the Ardennes, and so the region was largely neglected in the pre-war years. Held by two second-rate French divisions, it was perhaps the weakest part of the entire border, and vitally turned out to be not impassable by German armour. The French defenders of the Meuse river crossings at Sedan were to find this out to their cost on the 13th of May when armoured spearheads of the 1st, 2nd and 10th German panzer divisions emerged from the forest and appeared on the outskirts of the city. Just a quick word here about the French in 1940. Many blame the French for their swift collapse in the early months of the war in the West and to be fair there's some justification. But, and this is a big but, those failures were formed by strategic decisions and poor coordination at the top of the French order of battle and not with the men on the ground. In fact, in many instances, individuals or small groups proved their courage and determination, often at enormous personal cost. Let's head to the northern edge of Sedan to highlight just one case. It was in this location, a Maison Fortifier, in effect a light anti-tank bunker with accommodation built on top, on the 12th of May 1940 that a group of just four men under French Lieutenant Boulanger first encountered Guderian's panzers as they raced for the Meuse. Despite being five men against the bulk of the 1st Panzer Division, they fought hard, knocking out several tanks with their 25mm anti-tank gun and holding off infantry with their small arms for as long as they could. They inflicted an important delay on the attackers until, eventually outflanked and assailed from all sides, their position was assaulted with grenades and machine pistols, with every man falling in the defence of their homeland. They would become the first casualties in the Battle of France. And this was far from being an isolated incident of bravery on the ground, as we'll see. Nevertheless, the German armoured juggernaut, supported by enormous numbers of Stuka dive bombers, managed to launch assault engineers across the river at key points, including right here north of the bridge known as Pont Neuf. With point blank supporting fire from the far river bank, they silenced the defenders and gained a foothold on the far side of the river, and by nightfall on the 13th of May had established themselves on the Marfe Heights on the western bank of the River Meuse. On the ground, Guderian who had achieved almost complete surprise, had to make a key decision. Did he consolidate, bring his slow-moving infantry across, or drive all three of his leading panzer divisions westwards as hard as he could, thus splitting the Allies in two? He opted for the latter, with a slight alteration. His plan, though, remained relatively simple. The tanks of 1st and 2nd Panzer Divisions were pushed westwards at top speed down the Somme Valley towards the Channel Coast, whilst his 10th Division would move southwestwards to capture and hold the high ground around the little-known village of Ston. In doing so, he would protect his flank from any French counter-attack and form a bridge for his infantry to catch up. On the other side of the lines at this time, French commanders pondered a similar question. Shocked by the ferocity of the German breakthrough, they were desperately trying to ascertain the situation and understand Guderian's intentions. The options were three. 
He would turn north to assault the BEF and the French First Army fighting Army Group B on the Dial Line. Two, he would turn south and assault the main Maginot Line from the rear. Or three, he would drive due west to split those Allied armies in two. The French though did understand that whichever way Guderian would pivot, he would still be vulnerable in one key location, the high ground at Ston. And so, much like the men of 10th Panzer Division and their accompanying soldiers of the Infantry Regiment Gross Deutschland, the French sent their armoured reserves directly for Ston. The scene was set for the battle which would become known as the Verdun of 1940. So let's take a look at the area they were heading to and understand just why it was so important. Located some 12 kilometers southwest of the city of Sedan, Ston sits atop a high plateau close to Mont Dieu or God's Mountain. At 330 meters in height, it offered unobstructed views of the entire region in all directions. The village itself was centered around a single main road with a distinctive water tower on its western outskirts and houses on either side as it made a sweeping right hand turn until it reached this spot, the Pan de Sucre or Sugarloaf, an observation point above the village. Beneath the Sugarloaf was a distinct hairpin in the road as it descended downhill and eventually off in the direction of Sedan. Running off the main road in the village were several smaller paths and tracks leading to houses and farm buildings on the edge of the village, each of which offered opportunities for defence. Beyond that were open fields, which, whilst passable, made any attacking armour and infantry vulnerable to well-prepared defenders. The whole village occupied less than a mile from end to end and, whilst far from imposing, was absolutely vital for both sides to hold. Let's take a moment to look at the relative forces at French and German disposal, starting with the German order of battle. Guderian's 19th Panzer Corps, the formation which crossed the Meuse at Sedan, was comprised like this. The three main units were the 1st, 2nd and 10th Panzer Divisions. They were supported by the elite infantry regiment Gross Deutschland. 1st and 2nd Panzer were those chosen to make the main westward thrust, whilst our focus will be on the 10th Panzer Division. Commanded by General Lieutenant Ferdinand Charles, it consisted primarily of the 4th Panzer Brigade, which itself composed the 7th and 8th Panzer Regiment, along with the 10th Rifle Brigade. Those tanks, the foremost of the German army at the time, were of the Panzer IV and Panzer III variants. More about those shortly. In addition, 10th Panzer and its attack on Ston had the support of Motorized Infantry Regiment Gross Deutschland, which in May 1940 was made up of four motorized infantry battalions. In all, around 90,000 men and some 300 tanks would be engaged in the actions around Ston. French forces in Ston and the surrounding area numbered approximately 42,500 and 130 tanks, including 34 formidable Char B1 Bis. Let's take a closer look. Arguably the most famous French tank of the Second World War, it was well known and for a very good reason. It was an excellent tank for its time. Weighing in at 31 tons, it had all round 55mm armour, thicker than anything the Germans can field at the time. It mounted two main guns, a 75mm in the hull and a high velocity 47mm gun in the one man turret, which would be operated by the commander. With a 307 horsepower petrol engine, it wasn't particularly fast, topping out around 16 miles per hour, and its limited fuel tanks gave it a relatively short range of around 100 miles in perfect conditions. That said, its armour and powerful dual armament made it a fearsome opponent for any German tanker. In command of one of the companies of B1 Bis to go into action was this man, 34-year-old Captain Pierre Biot, son of the general commanding the 1st French Army Group. Biot's skill in handling his tank would soon become legend in the story of the 1940 campaign. It's only fair though that we briefly consider the two main German tanks in use at the time, starting with the Panzer Mark IV. The Panzer IV was designed in the late 1930s as, unusually for the time, an all-round tank, with a good balance of speed, mobility, armour and firepower. With a crew of five and armed in 1940 with a short barreled 75mm main gun and two MG34 machine guns, it packed a punch. Its Achilles heel, if anything, was its relatively thin armour on its sides and rear. In 1940 though, it was the most powerful tank the German army could field. Its smaller relation was the Panzer III. 
a 20 ton Daimler Benz powered 300 horsepower medium tank, it could reach speeds on road of up to 25 miles per hour and offered a good balance of mobility and firepower, being armed with a 3.7 centimeter quick firing gun. Like the Panzer IV, its limited armor protection of just 30 millimeters also made it vulnerable to most Allied medium and heavy tanks of the time. But let's take a moment to recap the situation as it was in mid-May 1940. To do so, we can rely on this US intelligence report created at the time to report on the progress of the campaign in Western Europe. And the defense was doomed to failure because it was confronted with an entirely new technique in warfare, the plain tank infantry team in action. The world was staggered by the speed with which the German armored columns moved. What was the secret that enabled armies to move so far so rapidly? The secret lay in the organization of the striking spearhead. Armored forces came first, closely followed by motorized divisions, which peeled off, forming solid walls. And through the corridor thus formed, raced the supply trucks to feed the ever lengthening. So knowing that this was a vital location, Early in the morning on the 15th of May, German troops of 10th Panzer Division and Infantry Regiment Gross Deutschland arrived in the area of Ston from Sedan, with the intention of capturing the vital high ground and the westward pass it controlled. Following a powerful artillery bombardment, they began their ascent of these hills. With armour climbing the main road and rounding the hairpin into the village and supporting infantry climbing its steep banks to enter the village from the east, the fighting was immediately incredibly fierce and both sides suffered heavily. One man, Sergeant Durand, a veteran of the Spanish Civil War, single-handedly blunted a German column led by Panzermark IVs as they advanced into the village. The fighting raged all morning with attack and counter-attack leaving more armoured cars, light and medium tanks blazing along the main road. Eventually, after changing hands as many as seven times, a company of B1Bis entered Ston, clearing the area, but unsupported by infantry, were unable to consolidate their newly won ground. A series of Luftwaffe raids and anti-tank gun actions in the afternoon knocked out three B1Bis, forcing both sides to withdraw from the shattered village and to regroup before continuing the fight. For the Germans, the wider situation was by now clear. With French forces to their north and expected renewed attacks from the south, a bottleneck had developed. A decisive thrust from the direction of Ston ran the very real risk of cutting off the entire 1st and 2nd Panzer divisions, severing their supply lines and leaving them surrounded. Ston must be taken and held at all costs. The French too were aware of this and at dawn on the 16th of May they made their move. Committing two companies from the 49th and 45th Tank Battalions, one from the 4th Tank Battalion and several companies of infantry, they began their assault from the south and southwest to capture the southwest outskirts and Captain Biot's force of another 7 B1s making a wide sweep into the village from the northwest. Inside the village at this time were the infantry of the 1st Battalion, Infantry Regiment Gross Deutschland and unknown to the attackers, an armoured column from the 10th Panzer Division about to launch their own assault. Those German forces were placed approximately as follows, with infantry forming a rough defensive line in the farm buildings on the southern and western edge of the village here and here, occupying the Sugarloaf observation point and with anti-tank guns in the tree line here and that tank column aligned along the main road here, ready to attack westwards out of the village. Leading the way under the orders of Commander Malaguti in his B1 Vienna in the inner column, the tanks rolled out as the French artillery began to soften up the German positions in Ston. As Malaguti and Delapierre's tanks of the 3rd Company began to advance, they found the terrain heavy going and consequently it was the tank column led by Pierre Biot who first entered the village down this road from the northwest. To his considerable surprise on rounding the corner on which today stands a B1 as a memorial, Biot encountered two columns of Panzer 3s and 4s in staggered formation along the main road. Remaining incredibly cool, he ordered his gunner, Sergeant de Rouc, to open fire with a 75mm hole mounted gun at the final tank in the close packed column. At the same time, he trained his own 47mm at the leading tank, a Panzer IV. Firing simultaneously, both burst into flame on the very first shot, effectively trapping the remaining armour on the road. Then all hell broke loose. Within a matter of seconds, rounds were slamming into Biot's tank, Jur, 
from front and anti-tank guns on the flank, with literally dozens of rounds striking and ricocheting off the hull and turret, none penetrated. The B-1's thick armour was able to soak up all the enemy fire and began to advance. Moving along the length of the column from the left, he fired round after round into the stationary armour, reportedly knocking out the entire column of 13 tanks in just a few minutes. Commander Malaguti, arriving moments later from the field slightly north of the water tower, also opened fire and recalled the scene. I entered stone, and suddenly, after the first turn, I found myself face to face with a column of German tanks. I fired as quickly as possible. Without understanding what was happening, my gunner did the same. Our tank was still firing. The Germans were no longer reacting. I saw some fleeing from the rear of the column. I saw that there were 12 or 14 tanks there, the first of which were Panzer IVs. The others seemed to me to be Panzer III's. Bilot, speeding up and running close to one side of them, had already hit them hard, and the Germans were trapped, for they were in cotton, tied together, without any distance between the tanks. Biot pushed on, passing the last tank and moving towards the bend in the road through the street which was almost blocked with knocked out armour. Approaching the hairpin turn on the southern edge of the village, he again came under fire, this time from an anti-tank gun positioned at the base of the Sugarloaf at almost point blank range, but firing his 75mm gun knocked it and its crew out. One final anti-tank gun was met as Jur continued down the sloping road away from Ston and this too was knocked out before Biot and his exhausted but exhilarated crew came to a stop about here. In just a few minutes, one French tank had knocked out 13 German tanks and two anti-tank guns, receiving an astronomical 140 hits in the process. Much like the appearance of the Soviet KV-1 when first in action, and the Tiger tank after that, the B-1 Bis heavy armour and its crew's determination to press home the attack despite enormous odds had simply proved too much for the German forces in Ston. As Biot's tank turned to return uphill to the village, the vital ground had been taken, but the fight for Ston was far from over. Combat raged all across the Ston Plateau for the rest of the day and much of the 17th, with B1s continuing in the fight throughout that time. German tank gunner Karl Koch described the experience of coming up against a B1. Between engagements, we were looking for ammunition from the knocked out panzers in front of us. After a while, a fourth tank appeared through the orchard. It was a real monster, and we had no idea that the French had tanks like that. We fired 20 shots at it, without success. However, after a few more shots, we managed to knock off his tracks. After a while, a fifth tank appeared, another B-1 bis firing all his weapons. Despite the prowess of the B-1 bis, as Koch alludes to, it wasn't entirely invulnerable. Slow moving, with poor communications, very limited vision and mechanically unreliable and vulnerable like all tanks in its tracks, it could be knocked out at very short ranges and often fell victim to more daring infantrymen when attacking with supporting troops. Despite the incredible wild ride of Biot as it was dubbed in the press, and the much overlooked heroism of other B1 crews such as Malaguti's Vienna and Lieutenant Dumex Rikvia, their efforts were ultimately in vain. After changing hands an incredible 17 times, Ston was retained by the Germans and the corridor westwards remained open. Within two weeks, the British Expeditionary Force and the French First Army were surrounded outside Dunkirk and Lille, and within a month, France had fallen. Ston itself was utterly annihilated by the fighting which raged in its streets and gardens and left littered with the wrecks of more than 50 French and German tanks once the fighting had finally subsided. But for many of the Germans involved, they would always remember that fierce fighting for a hilltop village, with one German officer writing, I will never forget the fighting at Stalingrad, Monte Cassino and Ston. More than 80 years on, the actions around Ston, Sidon and many other places stand as a testament, not to the failures of the Western Allies to halt the German Blitzkrieg in 1940, but as examples of personal bravery on the battlefield, where individuals and small groups fought and in many cases fell to defend their homelands. All told, more than 90,000 Frenchmen gave their lives during those early months of the war, a sacrifice 
we should not forget. That brings us to the end of this short virtual tour. If you enjoyed this video and would like to support what we do, please check out our Patreon at the link below. Your support is hugely appreciated. That's all this time. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you again soon.